Jack Osmond, and you're listening. This is Hudson Hammond, and you're listening to... I'm Richard C. Hoagland, and you're listening to... I'm Mark Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. We have an unidentified flying object. Welcome back to another great episode of Dr. J Radio Live. I'm your host, Dr. J, broadcasting from the City of Angels, or City of Demons, depending upon who you ask. And we are internationally syndicated, starting with our home base, Late Night in the Midlands, as well as their terrestrial affiliates in the United States. Also in the U.S., we have Black Swamp Digital Radio. And in the United Kingdom, we have Deprogram Radio, along with their terrestrial affiliates in London, Leeds, and in other parts of the UK, possibly even in the EU, as they keep expanding. Now, today, we are having a very special one-hour live show. The second hour will be something else for you to enjoy. But this is the first time I brought this guest on for probably almost three years, a little over two and a half years, that's for sure. He is a legend. I have literally been watching him for almost 30 years, 28 years to be exact at this point. And when I first saw him and I was mesmerized by what was happening in that documentary, and I remembered him. And that's why when I started doing radio, I reached out to him and had him on the show. And a lot of people who are listening were wondering, why did things change? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, the reason why I haven't said his name yet is I was hoping you guys would all go out and check out the website and see the promotion of who the guest is. Well, if you haven't done so, well, then let me start to introduce him. First, this should probably be a big thing to tell you about, is he was a an advisor for Nippon TV in, from Japan. And he came to the U.S. to check out Area 51. This was in the heydays of Bob Lazar, John Lear, George Knapp. And one of the most famous documentaries that I've seen that literally I remember watching in the early 90s, maybe even 90 or 91, was Dreamland. And that's when I was first introduced to our guest and, of course, had seen him since then. And that's why he was locked into my memory. And I'm glad now that he's not only a guest but a very good friend. So with that being said, let me introduce him to you. It's Mr. Norio Hayakawa. Norio, welcome back, my good friend. Thank you so much, Dr. J. It's uh, such a Pleasure for me to uh, be on your show again. It's it's always a pleasure to speak to you on and off air, and especially since what we were saying before, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, because you know things things happen that change our perspectives of reality. Now let me wind back the clock. Let's go before 1990. Let's go to 1989. Where were you living, and what were you doing? Well, in 1989, I was living in Los Angeles, the okay. same place you are. Yeah, yeah. So I was actually uh, living in, uh, actually, um, well, in a mortuary in Los ah. Angeles. <laughs> uh, strange as it may sound, uh, that was in 1989, and I was uh, living in the second floor of a lonely building just just outside of little Tokyo area in Los Angeles. And I was totally alone in this Japanese American funeral home. <laughs> and uh, I was, uh, you know, sleeping upstairs because they gave me a room uh, so that I can answer calls at night because nobody was there at night. You know, all the employees just come in during the daytime. So they gave me a room and uh, gave me a job of answering the telephone live at night. And uh, that was an amazing experience. And uh, one night uh, I was listening to the radio that was coming from Las Vegas. Uh, it yes. was called the Billy Goodman Happening Show. And on that program 
was this guy by the name of Bob Lazar, whom everybody knows now, but at that time, very few people knew about Bob Lazar, and uh, he claimed to uh, uh, be working on a special project at uh, Area 51, uh, actually just south of Area 51 called S4. But uh, I was listening to this Billy Goodman happening show in which he was a guest at least uh, several times a week at that time. And uh, I heard it. I heard the radio broadcast. It was around like uh, one o'clock in the morning. And, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, it was very quiet at where I was. <laughs> it was a mortuary. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I enjoyed listening to that uh, show. Uh, so uh, that was in 1989, and that was the beginning of my long years of uh, investigation into what Area 51 was and is, even now. Before so, that, did you believe that there was extraterrestrials, or were you wondering that? I mean, or did what, what, what did you believe prior to 1989, prior to hearing Bob Lazar? That was that is a very good question because I have always been interested in the possibility of existence of uh, extraterrestrials, uh, physical extraterrestrial. I mean, uh, literally physical. So, uh, but uh, I wasn't sure, you know, because uh, for many many years, especially uh, in the late 1970s, I used to read books published by John A. Keel, as well as by Dr. Jacques Vallée, and yes. I had uh, been influenced by them, who came to the conclusion that uh, the extraterrestrials were not necessarily physical in nature, and uh, so I was into that kind of uh, uh, concept about extraterrestrials, but I wasn't still real sure. But uh, that was in 1989. But uh, then uh, later on, I came to reaffirm my old uh, belief that uh, we may not be talking about actual physical extraterrestrials. And this is the reason why uh, 1989 was meaningful to me, because uh, it was a test of whether... I really believed in physical extraterrestrials or not, and uh, Area 51 caught my attention while I listening while listening to the Billy Goodman happening show, and while listening to this claim of Bob Lazar in 1989. So flash now. Now we fast forward to 1990. I I assuming that, now this was during the filming of Dreamland, which included you, John Lear, George Knapp, Bob Lazar, and I believe a handful of others. And I recall one of the interviews of you was talking about what either you had filmed at Area 51 or you had seen, which were essentially lights. What did you think was remarkable about what you were seeing and what you caught on camera? Well, I was quite impressed by the appearance of very bright light uh, that appeared suddenly over the Groom Mountains, which cover Area 51, you know, from, uh, you know, people's uh, view. Uh, so... It was, we were standing on uh, Highway 375 and uh, Dirt Road by the mailbox uh, that belonged to a rancher by the name of Steve Medlin, uh, who lived not too far from Area 51. But, uh, you know, uh, I was, we were so impressed by this appearance of this uh, bright orange uh, light that suddenly appeared and made some interesting maneuvers uh, in the sky, but I was quite impressed, and the, so did the TV crew. But uh, over the years, as I visited that area, and I also visited the uh, right next to the perimeter of the uh, boundary of Area 51 many, many times thereafter, but uh, over the years, uh, I came to realize that uh, there's no actual proof 
of any extraterrestrial activity at Area 51, and uh, I came to the conclusion that what we were seeing were probably uh, testing of uh, special programs uh, by the U.S. government. So, yes, that was my conclusion. We do know for a fact that the SR-71 was tested there, developed there, and flew out of there. As a matter of fact, recently, within the last five to ten years, because enough time has passed, the pilots who were actually at Area 51 that flew off in the SR-71 and the SR-71A said that that's exactly what that base was for, just a pure Air Force base installation that was testing secret military craft and nothing more. Now, when it comes to Bob Lazar, he re there's a new documentary about him. I haven't seen it. I, I have some friends who were involved, and I also know the person who made it, Jeremy Corbell. And Third Phase of Moon knows the producers, and they told me essentially that it is nothing new. I'd seen Bob Lazar in person in 2015, and again, the story hasn't changed. Nothing new. He's he, There's no other details he can offer. This is a pure speculation, Noria. What do you think happened with Bob Lazar for him to believe or or to come out with the claim that that he was reverse engineering extraterrestrial craft and that he had read all these briefings that we humans had been visited for tens of thousands of years, possibly millions. We had 63 external corrections that made us to Homo sapien. All these briefings that he was told and or read about. What do you think the reason for that was? Well, basically, here's the bottom line, uh, Dr. J that no matter what anybody says about aliens or UFOs or whatever, you know, there's absolutely no tangible, physical, irrefutable, solid evidence whatsoever, even now that we have ever been visited by physical, extraterrestrial, spacecraft piloted or maneuvered by physical extraterrestrial biological entities of any kind so far absolutely no proof whatsoever even today and this is the reason why uh of course bob lazar's story is fascinating and bob lazar has been saying the same thing over and over and of course he hasn't changed, uh, you know, what he says even today. But the bottom line is we don't have the physical evidence. It's a great story, no question about it. Even this new film of Bob Lazar called Bob Lazar and Area 51, I believe that's the title of this uh, latest uh, uh, movie uh, produced by Jeremy Cobell, uh, I guess. Uh, it was... Uh, debuted in uh, Los Angeles yeah, uh, on December ago. 3rd. Yes, two days ago. But the bottom line is, no matter how great this uh, documentary is, nothing has come up to tell us, and the scientific community as well, that uh, there is a solid physical proof of anything that he has said. You know, so this is the bottom line. And it's as long as we don't have any physical, tangible, universally, globally accepted uh, physical evidence uh, approved by the large scientific community of the world, uh, anything one says about Area 51 is simply a, a story, you know. And uh, so my position is that Area 51, of course, exists, no question about it. It's a very, very important facility uh, conducted with, a, you know, uh, our hard-earned tax dollars. So we have every right to know about Area 51, and uh, more, much of the information about Area 51 can be found in public sector, and it's a humongous test facility, research, development and test for all types of uh, military-related uh, 
aircraft, uh, radar, uh, you know, technology, you name it, uh, unmanned uh, aerial uh, vehicles or drones of various types, and including the latest, which I call the uh, the testing of uh, B-21, which is the latest, I believe, in the leading edge, uh, you know, uh, hypersonic aircraft. And uh, so, you know, that's the basic thing about Area 51. Yes, Area 51 exists and it's, uh, it's alive and, and well, even today. Uh, there are, you know, at least a couple of thousands of employees working there every day uh, at this facility, which is made up of uh, at least a dozen uh, uh, defense contractors, including uh, Northrop and, you know, Raytheon and uh, McDonnell Douglas and you name it. There at least a dozen contractors are present even today at Area 51. And just recently, in the last few months, they have revamped the entire uh, airport at uh, Las Vegas, uh, McCarran International yeah, Airport. There's LAS, a yeah. Yes, there's a section uh, that is operated by uh, AECOM, A-E-C-O-M, uh, used to be U-R-S, which used to be E-G-N-G. <laughs> but yes, this, yes, E-G-G this Special facility, Projects Building where Bob Lazar was hired. This building has been uh, renovated just recently, and they came up, uh, you know, with this new uh, ramps, and uh, they paved the concrete, uh, you know, parking lot, and so that this proves that there's definitely a lot of things still going on, if not more than before, at uh, this uh, particular uh, air part of the airport of Las Vegas McCarran uh, International uh, Airport, you know, and this is called the ACOM uh, facility that uh, is in charge of transporting the workers, and I'm talking about not manual workers, but, uh, you know, engineers and scientists uh, that fly to Area 51 from Las Vegas and then from uh, other parts of the uh, uh, South West, for example, uh, from uh, uh, California, even. Uh, Edwards, Edwards Ed- Air Force Base. Yeah, that's right. And from probably from Utah going to Area 15. So, you know, these uh, uh, transportation, uh, you know, uh, groups are called the Janet Airlines. But anyway, uh, even today, they are so busy transporting uh, engineers day in and not out, uh, you know, 365 days a year, except for Saturday and Sunday and uh, holidays. But, uh, you know, Area 51 is a real facility, but uh, as far as the aliens are concerned, it may have nothing to do with Area 51. But, you know, Bob Lazar started this uh, association of Area 51 with aliens because he was shown... uh, lot of documents uh, and even though he says that he worked on extraterrestrial vehicles over there you know we still don't have any proof in fact we still don't have any solid proof of the existence of s4 facility 10 miles south of uh, area 51 by papoose lake Uh, if you research the subject of s4 you know there's no s4 facility uh by Papoose Lake, even though there are many S-4 facilities elsewhere, like Tonopah, there's a Sector 4 facility in in Tonopah, you know, uh, area in Nevada, and then there's an S-4 area inside Air Force Plant 42 in Palmdale, California, you know. Uh, So S-4 simply means Site 4 or Sector 4, that Ah. is common in many military areas. But uh, uh, this particular S-4 that Bob Lazar was referring to uh, is simply uh, doesn't exist uh, except from the mouth of Bob Lazar and uh, John Lear. Now, 
there are a couple of things I wanted to say. First of all, I'm glad you mentioned Janet Airlines. That is something that people cannot refute. There's a lot of activity going on there. And during President Barack Obama's presidency, he did say and acknowledged Area 51 as a United States U.S. Air Force facility. So it's no longer something that doesn't exist. Well, clearly it did exist back in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s. They, it was just not acknowledged. And of course, that sign, I believe it's on Mailbox Road. I've never been there. Uh, you, you will definitely be able to tell me this. That sign that says they could use deadly force. Is that where Mailbox Road is, by the way? No, oh, that, that sign that... Uh... People have seen uh, photographs of, and a lot of people have actually been to the uh, perimeter of Area 51. Now, on the, we're talking about Groom Lake Dirt Road. If you go all the way towards Area 51, eventually you'll come to this warning sign area. You cannot step an inch beyond that uh, uh, boundary line. And uh, there is no fence there except some... Uh, uh, orange colored uh, metal posts uh, separated separating only you know about 100 feet of each other just metal posts uh, orange but uh, the uh, groom lake road uh, you know at the perimeter line there is a sign that says uh, no uh, trespassing but it doesn't say anywhere that uh, about use of deadly force in fact, uh, it says that no photography is allowed there. And recently they posted a sign that says that you are not allowed to fly any drones here. That's right. That's right. That's right. I, I do know if anything, if even a pilot, uh, you know, accidentally flies there, that they will get shot down. Uh, that, I mean, a lot of people, but then again, I have yet to talk to a pilot that's ever been threatened uh, by that, of course. And, you know, if someone was shot down over Area 51 and was killed, we would never, ever know. That's the irony of it. Now, from the time you were there, Norio, the U.S. government, the federal government, actually reclaimed more of the land. So people like you or, or John Lear or Lazar at the time who were bringing busloads of people literally to I believe it's some sort of ridge where you're able to look into what was happening Area 51 you no longer can have access to that I, I don't know how many acres or how many square miles is it 500 something square miles I don't know how much they reclaimed of that property around Area 51 but they definitely took more property and made it federal property that way you cannot get closer that's right. I think it was 20,000 acres of public wow. land surrounding the uh, uh, the <laughs> surrounding the perimeters of Area 51. In other words, uh, uh, the Air Force in 1994 created uh, uh, the what what's known as the buffer zone outside of another buffer zone. You know, so they uh, took away 20,000 acres. So now. No one can go to the perimeter uh, at Groom Lake Road and climb up the White Sides Hills or Freedom Ridge Hills. Uh, the only place that you can actually literally still see Area 51 is uh, about uh, 20 miles away in a uh, rugged uh, peak called Tikaboo Peak. Uh, and uh, you can still see the facility, but uh, you need... Uh, uh, binoculars uh, to see some buildings, uh, but uh, you know that's the situation right now. Uh, it's not impossible to see the Area 51 facility if you climb up the uh, Tikaboo Peak about 20 miles away, but it takes about two hours to climb up th that mountain, and you need to have a tremendously powerful, uh, uh, you know, camera to take take any photos of the facility. But people still do. People still do, and and uh, so you know. But uh, it's very difficult to see exactly what's going on at Area 51 because it's so far away in the distance. Even especially you, now. Especially now, yeah. But uh, plus, uh, 
they have uh, set up uh, a special uh, observation tower, unmanned observation tower, at the top of Atikabu Peak, in which they can be looking at how many people are there on the mountaintop at any time. So, you know, that's so if they know uh, if there are people around looking at Area 51 on top of Tikabu, Tikabu Peak, 20 miles away, the, the facility will know right away and they will uh, cancel certain operations that can be seen, you know. So that's how it is. But, uh, you know, uh, it's very rare that, uh, you know, people go to this place. Uh, it's too, too much troublesome to get climb up that peak so they're not too really concerned but even though they have uh, constructed this uh, special uh, uh, observation tower uh, under the name of uh, weather monitoring tower but actually the cameras are attached to this so-called weather monitoring tower on top of Tikabu Peak and uh, th those cameras can scan or look at the people that's on top of the mountain <laughs> and they relay the message to the facility and so you know uh, if they want to have a very very uh, special uh, project uh, test uh, they have to make sure nobody's looking at it so so even today they can still find out who's looking at that facility now let me say a couple things with regards to technology, we are so advanced right now, and what we have as civilians is pretty remarkable. And a, f a, f a friend of mine who is unfortunately very ill at this point because he's very old, uh, not very old, not Paul Hellyer old, but he was a Navy SEAL in Vietnam from 66 to 69. And the way he broke down technology is he says, what we have as civilians is the, what compared to the U.S. Army or Air Force is about two to three years behind. But special forces have technology that's about a decade ahead of us. And if we have all this technology that we civilians have access to now, I'm talking about these motion detectors with lasers, the, the small cameras that could be hidden as opposed to the giant ones from 30 years ago, I would imagine that the base is secured so much more than it was in the past and so much easier to be monitored. Now, let me throw two things at you, Norio, and I wonder... What, I wanted to get your take on this. In preparation for today, and because I have already talked to you since you've, you know, turned around uh, from your what you said in 20 years ago, I found two explanations that are s surrounding the web from skeptics of what could possibly have happened. Why Bob Lazar, if if in fact. Bob Lazar was not, and I'm going to make this clear for all the listeners because I don't want people to go on these wild goose chases and start saying I'm trashing Bob Lazar. I'm not doing anything of the such, folks. I'm just presenting something to my guest that I read from other skeptics just to get his opinion. So here are the two opinions, Norio. One is that the sports model that Bob Lazar worked on was not extraterrestrial, but was in fact a captured Soviet disc. And the reason why the seats inside were child size was because it was in fact made by the Soviets for children. That's one theory that's been going around. The other theory is that Bob Lazar was shown these briefing documents because that way, if he'd ever talked, then he could blame the ETs as opposed to saying the U.S. government has this technology. What do you think about those two claims? I believe Robert Schaefer, uh, the big, the skeptic, uh, he comes on the show. I've had him debate Stanton Friedman in the past. I haven't had him on recently. I, you know who Robert Schaefer is, right? Yes. Yeah, he, he operates badufos.com. Very intelligent guy, by the way. He's in Mensa. And usually when I want a debate 
uh, between you know Richard Dolan or Stanton Friedman and somebody who you from a ufologist versus a skeptic, it's Robert Schaefer that's always the one who's up for the debate. And so, one of the things that that he also claims is that Bob Lazar was shown this stuff that way when if he spoke or maybe they wanted him to speak to throw people off of what was really happening. Again, I'm not telling everybody out there this is what I believe. I'm just throwing out the ideas that are have surfaced from other investigators. What do you think about those two claims, Norio? Yes, I think there's a I would rather take the second, uh, the latter part of what you said, the two possibilities. Uh, that's more uh, realistic as far as I'm concerned, rather than uh, talking about uh, physical extraterrestrial connection. Uh, I believe that uh, even uh, the filmmaker Jeremy Covell, who just produced this new Bob Lazar story, uh, documentary, even he tells that, uh, you know, what Bob Lazar says cannot be proven. Uh, so uh, the possibility, the most likely realistic possibility is that he was shown on purpose something that would... Uh, you know, eventually uh, protect him from being charged with espionage or be charged with something uh, by the government. And uh, so uh, he can always uh, give an excuse uh, using the alien connection to Area 51. <laughs> so, you know, that uh, scenario, the second scenario in which Robert Schaefer, Schaefer, uh, you know, supports. I think it's more realistic. And, you know, Bob Lazar himself has never uh, said that what he was shown was was, was uh, the reality, but he said that it's possible that he was shown something that was not true by the government, uh, on purpose. That That is actually true. I have seen an interview where he did say that. And as a matter of fact, a few years ago, when it was, I believe, the 25-year anniversary, he also said something uh, which isn't too shocking. He says he wished he never said a word about it. He says that way he could have kept his job and continued to work on something that he enjoyed because he enjoyed the propulsion. That was what he liked. He didn't enjoy what it was doing to his wife and the hours. The pay, the paycheck was pretty good, but he wishes he can go back in time and basically shut up about what he said. That's what he says he wish he could do because he says he does not want to be known as the UFO guy. That's why he never does interviews and he only recently did a short interview on coast to coast just to promote this film. And I know Jeremy Corbell for years and I know for a fact it took him a long time to convince Bob Lazar to do this movie because Bob Lazar currently runs a scientific store and they do a lot of government projects. It's called United Nuclear and now it's in Michigan as opposed to, I think it was in New Mexico, possibly where you live right now. And so he does not want to be known as the UFO guy because he said it interferes with his credibility when he's trying to do science projects or contracts for the government. And so that that's one thing there as well. Now, uh, we also have Stanton Friedman. To this day, Stanton Friedman tells me off air that he wants to believe Bob Lazar, but he just cannot because he said there's nothing there that supports that he is who he says he was. What do you think about Stan Friedman's claim that Bob Lazar is a fraud? Well, I uh, think Stan Friedman's uh, criticism is rather harsh because 
Uh, personally, I don't think Bob Lazar is a fraud uh, in t by intention at all. Uh, he, he's a very uh, uh, normal guy in the sense that uh, you know he doesn't want to be. He, he does. Uh, he doesn't claim himself to be a, a you know have any association with fraud. But uh, Stanton Friedman immediately classifies Bob Lazar as a fraud and, uh, you know, a uh, hoaxer. But, uh, but in essence, Bob Lazar has never been a hoaxer uh, or a fraud. Uh, he just uh, uh, told his story saying that he was shown something by the government and, uh, and then uh, he claimed that uh, what he was working was extraterrestrial. But, you know, the bottom line is that he may have been deceived. And, you know, Bob Lazar is really not, uh, was not really in it for money. Because, uh, you know, it's hard to make a living on UFOs. <laughs> That's it's a true. fact. And that is very to, true. Yeah. So his main job now, and his main job has always been the scientific equipments and uh, then uh, doing odds and ends uh, for some contractors. And uh, that, is, that is his main job, but his fame is, uh, was promoted not by himself, but people like John Lear and George Knapp. Yes. yes. A, George Knapp and uh, John Lear and others promoted Bob Lazar's story to, it seems like to me that in order to promote themselves, you know, like uh, people like George Knapp may be sincere, but he would be nothing without Bob Lazar. And John uh, Lear is uh, actually this, I don't want to say anything bad about him because he's a great guest and, you know, he's a good friend of mine, but every time we do a show, he all regardless when I say, hey, let's talk about something different this time, he likes to bring up what happened with Bob Lazar and how he essentially found out about S4 and how he set him up with George Knapp. But I, I see where you're coming from, where if it wasn't for Bob Lazar, John Lear and George Knapp would not be nearly as famous in the ufology world as they are. Exactly. This is the reason why George Knapp says that uh, the claims of Bob Lazar never changed, and Bob Lazar has never changed his story. Sure, why should he change his story all these years? Because from the very beginning, uh, his story, no matter how fascinating it was, didn't have any solid, uh, you know, backing by the... Uh, uh, the vast majority of the world's uh, reputable uh, scientific uh, uh, people in the science community at large. And so, you know, as I told in the beginning of this program, we have no universally accepted physical, tangible, credible, even documentary evidence whatsoever that we have ever been visited by physical extraterrestrial uh, beings in physical extraterrestrial spacecraft, and that's the bottom line. So no matter what people say and claim about aliens, as long as we don't have this final, solid, tangible, ir irrefutable evidence, this is all just a story, a good story, just like the uh, story about the existence of alien base in Dulce, New Mexico. It's a great story, but the bottom line is where is the tangible, solid, physical evidence? And uh, as long as we don't have that, everything else is a good story. And it sells, and it brings people, unknown people, into the limelight, who uh, otherwise would be in the dark. But uh, there are people who benefit from promoting this type of stories for one reason or other personally or uh, whatever. <laughs> so that's the bottom line. And I'm not saying, and I have never said,
that there are no extraterrestrial entities in this wild, wide cosmos. In fact, there probably are. But uh, whether they come here is a different story. Whether they have ever come here is a different story, you know. And uh, so, uh, plus the second thing is that I have never been a debunker of a uh, uh, phenomenon that cannot be explained uh, by science. In fact, there are uh, many phenomena in this world, phenomena, uh, w which I call paraphysical phenomena, that cannot be explained by scientists, and we cannot debunk uh, such uh, a possibility. And this is the reason why, while accepting the possibility of existence of paraphysical or paranormal activities of all kinds, uh, I cannot uh, accept the definitive conclusion that we have been visited by physical entities in physical spacecraft. And so that's the bottom line. Even uh, Dr. Jacques Vallée and John Keel admits that this phenomenon is real, but it may have nothing to do with actual physical alien visitations. You actually answered a question that I was going to ask, which is, do you believe that intelligent life exists out there? And of course, your answer is yes. I, I think that with all the Goldilocks planets that are found, and that only limits us to the scope of what we can live on. So let's just say the, the Goldilocks planets, they're not too hot. They're not too cold. They have water. They have oxygen and therefore they can support carbon-based beings. But what happens if you have life that is uh, silicone-based or something else based and doesn't breathe oxygen? Well, then that opens the doors to that many more possibilities of different types of life forms that are able to exist on planets that we think are not habitable by us. And I think by narrowly focusing on the Goldilocks planets, that's also doing a disservice to humanity by saying, well, we, they could only support life because we have to live that way. Well, that not, is not necessarily true because what happens if other life doesn't need oxygen to live off of things like that now let me go back and i don't know if there was a an aha moment or something that you did, it gradually changed over time from 1990 after i saw the documentary dreamland which i recently saw again norio that was one of the reasons i called you and and of course, to catch up with you, when did you change your mind from what you said then that you emphatically believe that Bob Lazar was working on an extraterrestrial craft, reverse engineering it, and the lights that were filmed by you, I believe, with your camera crew and other people were essentially violating the laws of physics. How many years later did you start to unravel and change positions? Well, I believe that uh, ever since 1989, uh, as you said, I became interested in Area 51. But uh, over the next 10 years, from 1990 uh, to, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, to, to 2000, I have changed the position, and I have uh, begun to take the position that that there probably is nothing alien about Area 51, but yet uh, it's an important base. Uh, it took me 10 years to come to the uh, assertion that Area 51's theme was used or by the government uh, as a smoke screen uh, to to detract attention away from serious scrutiny of that base. And so I have come to the belief that uh, the Air Force have taken advantage of uh, people's beliefs in aliens uh, to bring out a laughter curtain of some type to 
uh, dissuade people away uh, of the reality of Area 51. And, uh, you know, I like the word uh, laughter curtain uh, because that's exactly what was produced. And uh, Bob Lazar's role was part of that uh, because in, in 1988, by the way, uh, Area 51 was indirectly, uh, well, suggested by uh, this magazine called Aviation uh, Weekly, uh, uh, you know, Aviation Weekly magazine. And uh, in 1988, uh, the U.S. defense industry was concentrating on stealth technology and uh, especially the the coding that they used to bring about a low rate of visibility and uh, I'm talking about the black uh, you know type of uh, chemical material uh, which was developed at that time and at that time the United States was very uh, worried about Russian and Chinese uh, scrutiny uh, of this uh, stealth technology. And so, you know, uh, somehow in 1990, uh, with the explosion of the Bob Lazar situation and the Area 51, uh, the notoriety, and I'm talking about the alien uh, presence of Area, Area 51, that concept has been purposely, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, diffused by, uh, you know, um, purposely uh, uh, promoted, I would say, rather that's the correct word, purposely promoted by the defense industry to bring about a laughter curtain uh, about Area 51 so that uh, when you talk about Area 51, people will laugh at you because you think that you believe that there are aliens in Area 51. But the main point about Area 51 was the development of the stealth technology and the new type of uh, stealth coding that uh, people like, uh, groups like Amoco was developing. You know, Amoco was one of the first companies to uh, research about the uh, uh, new type of uh, chemical that produced the stealth coding for stealth aircraft. And in 1988, in Aviation Week magazine, they had a comical uh, picture of an alien on page 51 of the October 20th issue of Aviation Week Space Magazine. And uh, there was a full page a statue of a gray alien. And then uh, on the other side of the page was this promotion of the uh, uh, new development of uh, uh, technology that would alter the future uh, you know, uh, uh, aviation industry. And that was namely the, uh, the, the new uh, type of uh, chemicals for stealth coding, for stealth technology. And they were afraid that the Russians and Chinese were going to get more information. So, you know, that was uh, my take on it. But uh, it, it turned out that that may have been the case. Now, when you mentioned earlier about Dulce, and what were the stories you heard about Dulce? And then again, what made you change uh, your mind uh, about that, what people were saying that didn't happen? Well, because I mean, I, I don't remember his name, Philip. I can't remember his last name. There was somebody who has claimed that he was working as a geologist and was digging tunnels, and somehow they reached breached uh, an area that encountered these extraterrestrials living underground, and then ensued a firefight. Uh, Schneider, yeah. Schneider, Philip Schneider, Phil, I believe Phil is his Schneider. name. Phil yeah, Schneider. yeah. And I would say that Phil Schneider was the equivalent of Bob Lazar, Area 51. Phil Schneider was to Dulce, as was Bob Lazar was to Area 51. And strangely enough, the topic of Area 51 and the Dulce facility, alleged Dulce facility in New Mexico, came around at the same time. And that was in 1988. 
And uh, the originator of these two stories, uh, one of the early originators was uh, John Lear. And in 1988, uh, or rather 1980, yeah, I would say between 1988 and 1989, John Lear had enough information that he heard from other people about uh, Dulce. And so in 1988, John Lear came out with his hypothesis about Area 51 having to, you know, this alien connection and also the Dulce facility in uh, New Mexico. Uh, that was in 1988. And many people cannot associate Area 51's um, uh, debut with Dulce, New Mexico's debut. They came around the same time. And so, as I said, Bob Lazar in 1989, came out with the story of an alleged alien confrontation between U.S. Delta forces at uh, an unknown military base. Uh, he said that incident took place in 1975 without naming the location. And Phil Schneider, in 1995, came out with this story that he was part of this uh, geological expedition in New Mexico and that he was part of this uh, team that created the Dulce base. But, uh, you know, uh, he heard by that time in 1995, Phil Schneider had read about Bob Lazar and he had heard about Bob Lazar's claims of an alien type of uh, scenario and confrontation between U.S. forces. And he decided to plagiarize, so to say, that story from Bob Lazar. And he started claiming that in 1979 in New Mexico, there was a firefight between aliens and the U.S. Delta forces. And he took that story exactly from Bob Lazar's claim. And so a lot of people uh, don't understand this, but, uh, you know, the idea of Dulce Base and Air 51 came around at the same time. Uh, there is, uh, we're running out of time, so I'm going to try to get here. So, this is one question here. It says, did they threaten him, meaning you? He changed his story. How do you respond to that? Actually, no such thing. In fact, uh, you know, I've been in this investigating this Area 51 stuff uh, for many, many, many years. And, uh, of course, in early 1990, I had uh, the only brush with uh, danger I had was in 1991, in which a uh, uh, U.S. Uh, military helicopter tried to chase us out of Area 51 on the Groom Lake Road. Uh, but... Uh, you know, that was the only incident that I ever encountered that I feel like, uh, you know, I've been threatened. But uh, that's uh, understandable because at that time the government was concerned that people were driving on Groom Lake Road to the perimeter of Area 51. And, uh, you know, uh, so especially when they saw six or seven cars driving in a caravan towards the perimeter, of course, they were alarmed and they sent the uh, uh, military helicopter to chase us uh, out of there, even though we were driving on public dirt road, you know, because we never drove through the perimeters of Area 51. We just was driving to the perimeter of Area 51 on public dirt road, which was Groom Lake Road. But uh, nevertheless, uh, they were concerned, and so uh, I, it's understandable that they sent this helicopter to, uh, you know, make us uh, afraid. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, that's the hindsight, and uh, I think uh, it was reasonable. But uh, other than that, I had never had any kind of uh, reprisal from the government for speaking about Area 51 and uh, even Dulce. <laughs> Although Dulce is a different situation from Area 51 because there's no such facility physically visible called Dulce facility, even today. It's just a story. <laughs> yes. 
Have you received a lot of slack from other ufologists from changing your position? Yes, that's that's right. Because there are many, many, many so-called ufologists and many in the UFO community that accuse me of being a government agent. And that's the favorite tactic of uh, uh, brainwashed uh, people who are firm believers in aliens and uh, Area 51 alien connection and Dulce base connection. And those folks, I believe, are brainwashed so much so that anytime anybody changes his mind about these topics, they accuse you of being part of the government. And that it bring me, it brings me a lot of laughter, you know, because uh, that's a favorite tactic of anybody that is brainwashed and that immediately thinks you are a government agent if you don't agree with them. I hear a uh, question, third phase of moon says, Norio believes no alien tech whatsoever exists at Area 51. That's right, because there's no evidence. Yes, there are some amazing technologies that have been developed, but there's no proof uh, at this time, whatever, that aliens has anything to do with it. it you know, it's this, it's just uh, the scientists, the hardworking scientists' uh, uh, devotion to their, uh, you know, job and to finding more, better technology for a lot of weapon systems and aircraft and so on. That's what, that's what it is all about. So, uh, you know, I feel sorry for those who are totally brainwashed into believing that uh, alien technology is uh, operating at Area 51 or people who believe that Dulce base is filled with uh, aliens working with the U.S. government to produce, uh, you know, uh, a new type of a bio robots or something like that. You know, they are totally brainwashed and I don't blame them or being brainwashed because it may have been the government who tried to persuade them to believe that way. Now, because we are literally down to the hour, Norio, I do want to ask you, let me see if anybody has any questions or comments because you have essentially attacked them or said them all. Let me read what this last one is. Uh, I believe, no, this one is just a comment within people. Well, let me ask you this, Norio. If you have a final statement uh, to wrap up this hour and about your belief and about what you witnessed 28 years ago versus how you feel now. What would you say to everybody? I would say it was a wonderful, amazing experience, amazing years in the early 1990s when I was involved in uh, pursuing the uh, bottom, uh, you know, uh, the, the bottom of Area 51 as far as research is concerned. It was those amazing years and which I enjoyed very much and I learned so much about people's beliefs and how people's beliefs can actually uh, affect part of a society uh, and so I have no regrets for delving into things like Area 51 and things like Dulce, New Mexico uh, while I believe that there's nothing alien about these facilities, uh, especially Dulce. There's no even proof that Dulce base exists. But anyway, I have uh, no proof of any alien connection to military bases. But I have always stated that in this world, there are things that we cannot explain. Uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, about life and death. And I'm interested in life and death. I'm interested in things that uh, we cannot explain by our so-called scientific, uh, uh, you know, uh, approach. And I believe that in this mysterious world, there is definitely uh, some kind of uh, unknown phenomenon that exists. And so I have not been any denier of about the existence of paranormality or paraphysicality of some phenomenon. And so. This is the reason why I still continue to be interested in uh, this type of things. Uh, I believe that uh, what is happening in Dulce, New Mexico, is probably some kind of a, 
a phenomenon associate with, associated with paraphysical phenomena of some kind. So I'm not a denier. But uh, to talk about physical, actual, physical, tangible aliens and tangible alien technology, I am very much uh, skeptical about that. Well said. Well said, Norio. And thanks again. Let me uh, throw some plug-ins here. For all the people in the YouTube chat, of course, I want to throw out a shout-out to everybody. We have Chad Dentant. I hope I said that right. Cold Warrior. And, of course, Adaraiki, Adaraike Studios, which I should just say his name. It's Adam Keen. He is my editor and my moderator. We also have here Nolberto Kales and Derek Turner. And, of course, we got Adam Ambrose, another guest of mine who's been on several times before with amazing, amazing uh, paint drawings that he's made. And, of course, Third Phase of Moon, the world's largest UFO YouTube channel. Check them out. And they have over 630,000 subscribers, I believe, at this point. The Cousins Brothers in Hawaii. We also have the Mysterious One. And let's see if there's another person in here. Super Arashi 90. And um, I believe that is all the people in the YouTube chat. Now, for Late Night in the Midlands, I have to thank Katie and Daryl Neely, of course, for doing all the hard work behind the scenes and for being audio engineers and the station managers of this network. Now, we also have Wise Frog, Black Swamp Digital Radio, and in the United Kingdom, deprogrammed radio. Now, also, folks, announcement, the archives on drjradiolive.com will be soon ready, so check them out. And I say this every show until it's grilled into your head, folks. The name of the show is Everything You Need to Remember. Everything is, every social media account is under the same name. So, for instance... I'll list them all here. We have Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, Tumblr, BitTube, Bit.Tube, Buffer, Pinterest, Instagram, Google+, YouTube, and also Minds Patreon. All of them is at DRJ Radio Live. Check on Patreon soon for some exclusives that we will be offering soon. And Minds, folks, if you guys don't have a Minds.com account, I highly suggest opening it. It's an open source social media platform that pays you in cryptocurrency for basically doing exactly what you do on Facebook. Except they're not going to be selling your information because it's open source. And if they were, it'd be written in the code. And there's a lot of intelligent discussions there. They tried to combine a, a sort of like an Instagram and a blog and Facebook and a Twitter kind of together because it uses at tags and hashtags. Now, I'm not here to promote mine. I just want to let you guys know why you should check it out and open an account. So remember, everything is at DRJ Radio Live and the website is drjradiolive.com, drjradiolive.com. The show, folks, remember, Monday through Fridays, and Fridays we do Flashback Fridays where we have started from the very first show that I've ever done, which at the time was I was hosting Third Phase of Moon Radio. So this Friday we haven't announced the guest of who it'll be, but it'll be the fifth show that I had ever done on my own. And on top of that, folks, I guess I want to thank all the listeners out there in the United States and in the UK and, of course, all the people I gave shout-outs to in the chat. And I also want to plug in one more thing. Pam Vrettenberg, she is my social media manager. Check out her website, unitedtruthseekers.com. With that being said, folks, I am signing off, and you guys stick around for the second part which is another guest from a previous show thanks again folks have a good night and a good morning for those in the eu and uk